Hey there, everybody. My name is Tim Bray, and I'm a senior engineer here at Amazon Web Services. And this is our fourth session in, on messaging technologies, the range that we offer, what you might use them for, and so on. Today, we're going to be talking about the use of large-scale messaging technology, mostly SQS, uh, in the BBC, British Broadcasting Corporation. And we have with us, all the way, eight time zones away from London, uh, Stephen Godwin and Chris Darliston from the BBC. And before we proceed with introductions and so on, just a reminder that this is Twitch. It's, it's interactive, and if there's anything you'd like to ask us about streaming or broadcasting or really anything at all, uh, drop it into the Twitch and we'll probably see it and uh, get back to you. Uh, under no circumstances are, are our guests prepared to discuss the royal wedding, however. So gentlemen, <laughs> perhaps you could introduce yourselves and tell people how you fit into the picture over at the BBC. Uh, I'm Christopher Darliston. I'm the development lead on uh, the Broadcast Interactive Data Service on TVs. And uh, my team is responsible for helping getting the journalistic content uh, from some internal tools through our AWS estate and then out through our broadcast and transmission system where ultimately it makes its way to TV sets across the UK where it can then be viewed. Hi, and I'm Stephen Godwin. I'm a lead architect at the BBC and I help design the systems that make the audio and video content from the BBC available online. Cool, excellent. Now in Canada, when we think of the BBC, one of the big things we think about is, of course, Doctor Who. And I have here with me a little set of Doctor Who Lego, hand assembled by our own Jeff Barr for the very first show in this series. And since we're on Twitch and talking about the BBC and Doctor Who, I suggest that if you care about that kind of stuff, you go and type BBC Twitch into your favorite search engine, and you will discover that um, we have just, uh, Twitch has just made a deal with, uh, with the BBC to broadcast, what does it say? Uh, hundreds of classic Doctor Who episodes, all of them between 1963 and 1989 on Twitch, and it's going to go on for seven weeks if, you're, if your synapses can take that, so, so good luck with that. Okay, now in this, in, today we're going to be talking about messaging technologies and mostly SQS. So I'm going to assume that most of the people watching this know what SQS is, but probably for, uh, I should outline it for the sake of those who may not. So, so very, very briefly, SQS is one of our very oldest uh, Amazon Web Services. It's like 12 years old these days. And it's the simplest thing imaginable. You have queues. You can create as many queues as you want. And there are really only three interesting APIs. Send a message, receive a message, delete a message. That's all there is to it. Um, one of the th ways it differs from some other messaging services is that it's accepted and normal to have multiple readers reading from a queue, but it's not the case that they all see all the messages. Each of them see a subset of the messages, they read a message, they either delete it, in which case it's gone, or they time out or something like that, in which case eventually somebody else will pick it up. SQS is super highly reliable. You will not lose a message once it goes on, on SQS, and extremely scalable. Um, you know, during uh, hot days, uh, we observe uh, messages running through it at the rate of millions per second, and, and that's fine. In fact, these days, serverless is sort of the, the hot new thing in town. And if you think about it, SQS is uh, sort of a canonical example of what a serverless service should be like because you don't have to pre-reserve any capacity, you don't have to do any kind of that kind of planning. You just say create a queue, start sending messages to it. If you're sending 10 messages a second, that's fine. If you're sending 10,000 messages a second, that's fine. And you can switch from 10 messages to 10,000 pretty well at the drop of a hat. So that's what I think you know, we'd like our elastic serverless cloud to feel like. And even though SQS is old, it still feels pretty modern in practice. Oh, and yes, the other thing I should say is SQS classically does not promise first in, first out. It does not promise that you will receive things in the same order that they were sent, nor does it promise that you will receive something only once. So there, just a year ago now, I guess, we introduced SQS FIFO, which is not quite as massively scalable as SQS Classic, but it does make those promises. You can arrange that things are processed exactly once and that they will arrive in the order that they were sent. And, and that's interesting in a lot of cases. 
Okay, enough about that. So I think today we're going to be looking at two different applications from the BBC. Uh, the one is called um, Video Factory, and secondly, the red button. Now, to those of us in the New World in Asia, the red button maybe sound a little puzzling, but I guarantee you that most people in Britain know exactly what we're talking about, and stay with, with us for a few minutes, and you will too. So let's start with Stephen and the Media Factory problem. Um, by the way, there was a, a presentation on this at reInvent, easy enough to find on YouTube. Just go type uh, uh, BBC Godwin into, uh, into, into YouTube and it'll, it'll pop right up. Um, so, Stephen, what is Media Factory and what, what did you need to do with it? So Media Factory is the system that um, basically powers all our online um, video and um, audio content. It's um, so it powers systems like BBC iPlayer and our news clips behind um, behind the scenes. Um, it's responsible for um, let me think. Um, it's responsible for sort of putting. It's responsible for taking files f that come in in this sort of high res, um, high bit rate format and turning them into all the different formats we need for things like iPhones and Android phones, um, or, um, smart TVs, tablets, PCs, Macs, all these different formats. And you can imagine that the format you use for something like a smartphone is very different to what you'd use for a smart TV because the sizes of the screens and so on. And then it puts those files where they can be accessed by the player and distributed easily out via things like CDNs. Um, we, we actually support over a thousand different devices um, for iPlayer and um, on a typical week this system um, will process over 10,000 hours of content so it's, it's quite a busy system and up on screen now you can see this is the iPlayer user interface. I can't actually play any video for you because um, most of our video is limited to being available in the UK, but I think we do have a little bit of video that shows you the sort of user journeys you might get in iPlayer. If we can switch to the video. Oh, there it is. So what are we looking at there, Stephen? So this is the main iPlayer homepage that you'd see on a PC if you were just coming in via a web browser. Uh, you can see we've got some box sets up there of content and going into one and um, just looking at the details, like I say, I'm sorry I can't play it and actually show you the player. <laughs> um, but then we've got all our different um, TV stations up there. So one of our TV stations, BBC Three, is actually online only. Um, this is BBC One, and here you could actually watch what's currently being broadcast live on BBC One, or in fact we've got a rewind window, so you can actually rewind the beginning of the currently playing programme, or up to two hours, um, and watch that. So, yeah, it's used quite extensively inside the UK. Um, I think rough figures, it's regularly used by about 30% of adults in the UK, so it's quite, quite a heavily used system. Here, here in Canada, we have the CBC, of course, and it, it's got some of this stuff, but not nearly as slick. This, this is this is great-looking stuff. So, so let's just zero in on the messaging technology. I, I, uh, hmm. What was the problem you needed to solve with the messaging technology, and why was it hard, and and where did you end up? Um, so, the problem we had was. Um, we wanted to rebuild the systems that were powering BBC iPlayer and get them onto. Um, um, get them um, get them into the cloud and so we were looking at sort of messaging technologies that would work well in the cloud and particularly for our sort of scenarios then we wanted to be able to be certain that a message wouldn't get lost and you were talking about the reliability of SQS in your introduction and yeah that's really important to us here because each message represents a piece of work so each mess a message could represent getting a piece of Doctor Who up onto iPlayer and if that message got lost then people would get very upset with me um, so that needs to, you know needs to have that degree of reliability and we also needed the system to not be overwhelmed we sometimes get quite big peaks of um, video coming through for um, processing so 
a whole load of content for the next couple of weeks might arrive in one evening, and so suddenly we've got hundreds of files to process. Um, and we wanted to be able to scale up our systems to be able to cope when those sorts of things happen. So not only did we need SQS or whichever messaging system we chose to be able to cope with those peaks, but we needed to be able to have a good way of being able to scale up our systems to also uh, cope with that and mean that it wouldn't take forever for us to get through that backlog. So we designed the system, and I'll move on to, I've got an architecture diagram here. Uh, we designed the system as a set of small services, of microservices, all linked together via SQS or a combination of SNS and SQS. So we used SNS where there were other people who would be interested in the events, and then we would be one of them and we would subscribe an SQS queue to that event. Or if it was just two of our components talking together, we just talking to each other, we'd just have an SQS queue between them. And this enables us to run these as lots of small Java applications running on EC2 instances and gives us quite a nice scaling model, which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit in a moment. Now, I hear, uh, I hear a rumor that you had to build all this in nine months with your back to the wall. Yes, yes. So we actually um, put this system, we started building this system in January 2013, and we didn't actually, and we had a con we had a um, a contract that was going to run out um, in September of 2013. So we decided we were going to move everything up to the cloud. We were going to rewrite it all in Java as well at the same time, and we had nine months to do it in. And if we didn't, then iPlayer stopped working, which would have been fairly dramatic. Um, so it worked. It went very well. Um, we were into sort of migration and testing stage by August. So. It was quite quite comfortable actually in the end, um, but um, yeah, it's a pattern that worked really well for us. To, the, to our listeners out there, I, I don't actually recommend that approach. I, I recommend <laughs> taking a little longer to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was um, it was it was one of our first forays into the cloud as well. So um, we we did all the hard things at once, but um, um, it went very well. Cool. So, talk to these this, this, these diagrams a bit. Uh, yes, yeah, so this this diagram shows our overall architecture. It's actually, this is a simplification. The original system we went live with was made up of um, over 20 microservices. Um, the system today does an awful lot more. It does things like Power Britbox, which is um, a service which makes BBC and other British broadcaster content from other British broadcasters available in the US and Canada. Um, and it also now does radio and live programs and lots, lots and lots of things. So now it's up to like 100 microservices. But yeah, here you can see the systems linked together by the queues. Um, we take video in from our broadcast feeds or we have it pre-delivered and we then have to sort of slice that video up if it's a live program coming in off the broadcast feed. And we have this time addressable media store where we can do that. Um, and we use actually Elemental's platform as a service offering in the cloud to do the transcoding. The original version we built as a sort of prototype um, used FFmpeg, but these days we use the Elemental's uh, use Elemental's platform as a service offering. We, we have a question from um, who was it again? Um, oh, I forget who it was. I'll get their name in a sec. But they asked, "Are you using the Elastic Transcoder service?" Uh, we're not. We're actually so um, we're using Elementals platform as a service offering, um, which Elemental are now an Amazon um, company as well, I believe. So there's a little bit of sort of duplication there in functionality available. We were Elemental customers before um, before they were purchased, so um, oh, cool. we've been on that system for a little while, um, and we have some quite specific requirements. That's actually why we're using that rather than ETS because um, our video will go out to things like set-top boxes, um, which are particularly fussy about the format of video they take because they've been built down to a price. Yeah. And things like smart TVs and things often will be a little bit fussy about the so video I have they take. another interesting question here from M. Musset. Um, and they want to know the sort of aggregate throughput and concurrent connections SQS and SNS is able to support for applications such as iPlayer. Now, I, I know you probably aren't at liberty to give exact numbers, but have you ever run into uh, a, a generally a capacity problem? 
We haven't run into a capacity problem with SQS or SNS. Um, right. I don't think, although I'd need to double check, I don't think we've ever, we've even had to ask for limits to be raised, but we are using quite a lot of queues. And we, yeah, we certainly put a reasonable amount of, um, a reasonable amount of messages through those queues. Yeah, um, so in fact, as I said earlier in the intro, on, on days when, when we're running particularly hot, like uh, Prime Day or, or Black Monday, is it? Or <laughs> uh, Black Friday, one of those black days. Um, uh, that thing is running at, at many millions of, of messages per second, and I've seen uh, SQS queues that have over a billion messages saved up in them at a time. So, hmm. so hmm. you know, this may not be uh, perfect and entirely ideal piece of software, but it's not going to run out of capacity on you. That, that's one yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so if I go on now, I can talk a little bit about how each one of those services is written. So they're typically a Java service um, running on an EC2 instance. Um, and it's, you know, the, the average one would have just an input queue and an output queue like this. And it'll be a camel. We use the camel framework um, for our Java application. Yeah, and you know, I've never actually heard of through. camel till about a year ago, and now I, it's crossing my radar all the time. It seems to okay. be a sort of a universal one layer of interaction between application code and messaging infrastructure. Is that a fair way to talk about it? Uh, yeah, it gives you a couple of things. So it gives you that level of interaction. And when I first built this system, I actually had to promise that I'd be able to bring it back down off the cloud if it didn't work. So that was part of the reason for choose, choosing it. But also, um, that's obviously quite an academic point now. Um, <laughs> the, it, it also, it gives a um, quite a nice abstraction layer for you building up processing of messages. So you can have things called routes, um, which... Um, you specify, actually, I'll go on to talk about one. Um, let me just find the code. That's right. Uh, we have a tradition here that no guest escapes without showing code. So uh, let's have some. So this, this, is, this, is, a, this is our one of our routes. Um, let me find it. So it's just a, a root is just a, a Java class. And inside it, there is this configure method. And the actual, there's some error handling stuff at the top here, which I might come back to. But the interesting bit really starts here with this from input endpoint. And then this is a, um, what do they call them? A um, fluent builder, um, which then describes what happens to a message when it goes through the system. So it comes from this input endpoint, goes through all these processing stages, I'll talk a little bit more about those, and then eventually hits this two piece at the end here, and that that actually generates a message going out. So this is you know one of those simple programs where we just have a message coming in, message going out. It might be producing, it might be consuming many many hundreds of them, um, but this is its basic outline. And if you and that comment at yeah. the top. Yeah, so if you look at the input endpoint here, this we actually wire queues into our programs dynamically at deployment time. So it's actually done as part of the cloud formation. And so the applications themselves don't know which queues they're talking to. They just know I have an input queue and an output queue. And but at runtime, that would be, then be resolved to this camel URL. So camel has this URL format to enable it to sort of act as this indirection layer. So it'll start off with AWS SQS, which tells it that's, that's the type of messaging system we're dealing with. Here where it says in queue, that would actually be the ARN of the queue. And then everything after the question mark is parameters effectively to the client library. So, I see you're using long polling. Yeah, so this piece here just says use the standard Amazon client basically. And then here, yeah, we're using, we set wait time seconds equals 20, so that enables long polling. Um, we set visibility timeout when we get the message of 60 seconds. So that's how long the message will remain hidden before reappearing if we don't do anything. And we've actually got this magic option as well, extend message visibility equals true. And what that will do is if Camel is happy that the process is running as it should be, um, then it will actually automatically extend the visibility timeout so you can actually run for much longer than 60 seconds. It will just keep on in the background renewing the, the lease on that message. So if you've got something that's running for significantly longer, as long as the application is still actually up and running and has a heartbeat effectively, it will keep on renewing that lease. 
You know, I think a high proportion of the people who are using SQS at scale are doing the long polling, you know, the wait time seconds option there, because it mm -hmm. makes it almost like streaming, you know, it, it, you know, it, because yep. you essentially you keep the connection wired up in, in practice. Yeah, yeah. So it means it means much, much faster turnaround times in, in getting the messages off the queue. Um, and then, yeah, I can talk through these very quickly. We've got these, proce these processes basically do something to the message each time. So you see we've got a whole load of things here to do with um, iSpy context. So iSpy is our internal name for our distributed trace system, and I can talk a little bit more about that later. And you'll notice there's some things people probably recognize in here, an SNS message extractor. So because this is actually a, a general pattern we use for a lot of our applications, if the message has come from SNS, it'll have an SNS en envelope on it, and this um, takes that envelope off and gives us the content of the message again. Um, the unmarshal here, basically, we've got the content, the body of the message is a JAXB object. Um, it, well, it's an XML object, and we're parsing it as a JAXB object. And this basically just checks that the message unparses properly, the message parses properly. And then we actually have validators on the individual fields. So it may still be a valid XML document, but the fields may actually not be make sense for this application. Um, this is our standard sample application, so it then just goes and calls the hello world function, um, which would be, it's just a POJO, um, and the input to a function on the, on the POJO would be the JAXB object, and what it returns would then be sent to the output queue. And the configuration of that output endpoint would probably look something like that, so we don't actually specify many options on our output endpoint. And then finally, we do a little bit of extra trace to say, yep, all, all done and completed. So that's, so having, that's the shape. Yeah, oh. Built this thing, okay. deployed it, installed it, and put it into production. Um, what have you learned? What are some key lessons that you think would be useful to pass on to the people who are thinking about doing something like this? Yeah, OK. So um, if I go back to my slides, and hopefully, oh, no, that's really not happy. Um, let me, there we go. There it is. Yep. OK. It's all right. It's just, I think, a little bit um, unhappy with. There we go. The switching of the switching of the presentation. So the things we've learnt. Um, so we scale to, scaling to handle peaks. We can do really well well with the SQS queues. So we use competing consumer pattern. So if messages build up on an SQS queue. Um, what we can do, we can run multiple instances of the service that's pulling messages from that queue. And because each instance, when it gets a message, it hides it from the others, that means that we don't end up with the instances treading on each other's toes. Um, one, mess one instance will grab the message, will we'll get the message, will hide that message, and then the other services can't see it. And when they go to get a message, they will get other, other messages. And what are you scaling the on? Queue depth? Uh, yes, yeah, so we auto scale on queue depth. Um, well, we'll typically run a minimum of three services, one in each availability zone. But because of that competing consumer pattern, if we need to grow um, to cope with a, a queue that's got, suddenly got very full, um, I can scale up to 30 instances and I will just go, well, 10 times faster than three instances. And it's pretty much linear scaling for that. So that's that's wonderful for systems where you get um, a large peak or something, you know, that sort of. Um, linear scaling, so easy to say and so yeah. hard to achieve. It's nice when you can yes, get exactly. it. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Right. So the other thing we learned um, was around error handling. So um, I mentioned that visibility timeout earlier. And um, I actually skipped over the exception handling code, but we've got it set up in Camel. And this is another thing I quite like about the way Camel works, that if we throw an exception and it bubbles up to the top level, what Camel will do is actually just let go of the message. It'll stop renewing that visibility timeout on it. And that means the message reappears on the queue, which means that if the reason something went wrong was that the application crashed, or that some dependent system we were calling, perhaps via network, perhaps a networking problem had occurred, then basically if we don't have a specific handling of an error, we just let go of the message and let it reappear on the queue. And that will happen up to five times, um, the way we've got it configured. And that's a really good way of just handling sort of generic 
I don't know, there was a networking glitch or this mm. system suddenly had a problem. And it gives us a very common way of handling error code rather than having to write that in all our apps. If we don't want specific error handling, we can just fall back on this and it will retry five times with a 60 seconds between each tie, try, basically. If that fails, if it goes all through all five times and it doesn't work, then it'll actually put the message on a dead letter queue. Right. And technically, this is what we used to have to do um, because we actually used to have to look at the, I think it's the approximate retry count header in the service and write the letter message out to the dead letter queue ourselves. Um, this line should really actually be all the way back here now because this functionality has actually been built into SQS for right. several right. years now. And it's the um, redrive policy, I think it's called. And yeah, right. by that yeah. you can yeah. specify yeah. exactly this. The DLQ machinery, dead letter queue machinery, is, is popular in a lot of services now. It seems to be a, a good and useful pattern. A couple of interesting questions. Somebody, mm -hmm. Splitbit, asks, is the time addressable media star also built on the cloud? It is. It is. It's built on S3. Um, I've given a talk um, previously. There's a, a My Architecture video um, about how that's built. Um, but yeah, that's, that uses S3 very extensively. Yep. That question was from Splitbit. Another question from Marshall BG. Uh, wouldn't wouldn't lambdas be better for this? Uh, lambdas would be lovely, um, but they don't support SQS. Um, uh, but we've announced that they're going to. So so that's that that will be fantastic um, because yeah we we build it like this at the moment. I mean lambdas didn't exist when we first built this system. Mm -hmm. um, but they are yeah. What we're doing here is very very similar to a lambda approach, right? Um, with the auto scaling groups and so on. Yeah, that's been quite a while coming. It turns out that the, the process of hooking SQS up to Lambda was harder than we thought. You know, mm -hmm. polling one queue is easy. Polling 100,000 queues is, you know, a serious engineering challenge. But they have announced it, and I, I don't know what the actual date is, but it should be uh, with us soon. And, and then, you know, even more, even more of your scaling problems go away. Well, well thanks, uh, Stephen. That's terrific. Um, let's turn our attention now to the red button, and I'm willing to bet that a large part of our listeners today have no idea what a red button might be. So, so, so Chris, do you want to take over and, and raise their consciousness? Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, we've got a couple of videos uh, to show. Uh, basically, the red button application is uh, it's an interactive data system uh, that can be accessed through your television set. So. On most uh, remote controls, uh, you have a set of color keys, a red, a green, a yellow, and a blue. And if you're on one of the BBC channels, then you can press red and you get into the interactive data system. Now, depending on whether your TV is connected to the internet or not, depends on how rich an experience you get uh, when looking at uh, the data. Uh, if you are not connected, then we're very limited by the bandwidth that we can send through the broadcast system to actually get to all the TVs. And so it's very text-based. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you have a connected system, then obviously we have got uh, a back channel being able to leverage off the internet, and then you can have a lot more graphics in there, and you can hook into things like iPlayer, and be able to play video streams as well through that. Uh, and so you get the same data, but if you're in a connected experience, then you will get a more fulfilling and richer experience out of it. Excellent. Uh, so what's the technology behind it? Uh, well, if Stephen can bring up this slide for me. Uh, we had a similar pro problem that Stephen had in that we had to go from uh, a, a solution that was dealt with by a third party. Uh, so we would push our data to a third party who would then uh, go through their systems and push it up to the broadcast. And we had a two-year project that meant that we had to bring that in-house. And similar to Stephen's example, uh, we looked at various different layers of our stack and how we could wire those up through SNS and then SQS uh, and build up a parallel processing stream uh, alongside the existing broadcast content uh, and be able to make sure that where we were looking at 
the data we're getting from internal tools, make sure that the new system that we had in place produced the same output. Uh, when we had verified that, then we could look at transforming that into platform specific. Now, when I say platform, we have different ways of broadcasting to uh, our audience, whether that is through uh, Sky platform, whether it's through a free view set top box or smart TV, or whether it's through FreeSat or uh, Virgin Cable. These are different ways and all have different uh, code that is then interpreted by the television or the set-top box to be able to take the content and show it. Uh, we were able to look through and to de-risk this project, uh, look at using SNS to uh, fan out to an SQS in the new world or uh, through to our existing broadcast platform uh, and be able to decommission parts of the uh, legacy estate as we were going through the, the two-year project. You know, when it came time to actually switch on our very final component and to move off the legacy platform to our AWS, to on-prem through Direct Connect, it was almost a non-event because we knew it was going to work. And so someone in our central coding facility and multiplexing pressed a switch and lo and behold, the old system was not used, the new system was used, and there was no interruption to service to the entire of the UK. When that that, that, that's great because you know building cloud applications these days is, is reasonably straightforward, but migrating applications from old to new, almost regardless of what old and new are, is always a very tense and nervous kind of thing. Yes, yeah. yeah. So the, being able to use AWS and being able to stand up uh, a second complete chain uh, and being able to validate each of those steps meant that actually when it came through to uh, switching over, as I say, it was something that we, we'd validated and we could switch platform by platform and there was no running around with your hair on fire uh, when there was a problem because there wasn't a problem. Cool. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, so are you going to show us some code as well? I, I am indeed. Uh, so if Stephen can bring up the code. Uh, we use a very similar system to, uh, as Stephen mentioned, what you've got code here is we have uh, a library function that uh, is calling through to SNS uh, and it will publish out through uh, the, to the SNS topic. So a very simple function there. Uh, going on to the next piece of code. Are you folks uh, all Java end-to-end -end everywhere? Uh, we're not. Uh, we have both Java and JavaScript. Uh, rather than bringing up duplicate code for each of the steps that we were using, uh, I pulled one of the types of examples, and it just so happened to be the same type that Stephen had got as well. Yeah. Uh, when we, in each of our set, sets of SNS and SQS, we also have S3 involved, and that's so that for us, security is the main concern. With us taking journalistic content and publishing it out to uh, all the homes in the UK, then you want to make sure that the content that is published uh, by the journalist is the content that gets all the way out to the TV. And so, uh, we use uh, S3 as a way of storing that content and then SNS and SQS for the message. And in that message, we then have a HMAC in there to validate that the message has not been tampered with from the publisher right through to the consumer that picks it up. And you can see in this piece, uh, we have a, a parallel stream for uploading all of the files to S3. Uh, 
we've got uh, an X-ray so, tracing. Uh, quick there. question on that. I, I see yes. you're using file, files .parallel stream there in, in your Java code. Are you just uh, turning it loose and letting it take as many threads as it wants, or do you control the concurrency at all? Or? Uh, we are controlling the concurrency. That's through uh, the config of the application. Okay. You know, so depending on uh, which of our platforms and which of the environments that we have, uh, we can then uh, define exactly how many streams that it's going to use. Uh, we've got an X-ray trace in there. So using X-ray, we're able to try and track each of the transactions through from where it enters our system, through the different hops that it makes, uh, so that if there is a problem at any point, we can then use the X-ray to then be able to narrow down and understand where the problem was in there. Uh, so if we can go into the next piece of content. Uh, here you can see our roots file in Camel, you know, very similar to the way that Stephen had his, except you can see ours is a lot smaller. Uh, and uh, we actually have the SQS name in there and uh, you can see that we have a visibility timeout of 30 seconds in there, and we've got the extend message visibility in there as well. One thing you'll notice is we've got concurrent consumers one in there, uh, and that's very much so that we can make sure that we're only picking up one message off the queue at a time. Okay. Uh, and this is because although uh, we, we don't actually have a lot of messages f flowing through our system, but they are deltas. So you, ha you highlighted at the start that uh, SQS, you may get out of order messaging, you may get your message more than once. Uh, so we wanted to limit the message that we were pulling in uh, and then being able to, within the Java code, understand had we seen this message before, were we getting an older message, uh, and then deal with it at that point in the Java code. Uh, this was, of course, before SQS FIFO came out, uh, and that was one of our problems that we had when we were wiring together SQS in this application. Is it, is, is it worthwhile for you to switch over to SQS FIFO, or is this basically OK? Uh, it's OK at the moment, but we do have a project uh, on the go where we are looking at using SQS FIFO uh, and looking at migrating to lambdas from EC2s as well. Um, um, yeah, to the next. Okay. Uh, what you have here is this is our reading of the message uh, as it comes off the stream. So further down in the application. And you can see it's very simple code uh, that all we're doing is uh, getting the AWS message as a string, uh, pulling that through, and then uh, doing uh, a JSON path read on it, storing it in as an object, and then that will then get passed into the core of the system, where the core will then go off talk to S3, download all of the files that it needs to from S3 after validating that the message is uh, a message that it wants to deal with and hasn't been tampered with. Looking at those S3 files, it will validate that, again, those have not changed from where the uh, producer has published them to S3 uh, before then doing what it needs to do to those files, and then publishing them on further down the chain. That, that's really admirably uh, simple and readable. I, I like to see that. Hey, M. Musset has another question, not really directly related to this, but you see, are you using containers yeah. at all? Uh, and specifically, are you using any ECS? Uh, we are using some containers, but we're not using ECS at the moment. Uh, but it is something that we are investigating at the time, at the moment. Okay. Given that we're uh, getting 40 minutes in, we should, we should move right along here. Um, so let me ask you, having gone through the work of building all this stuff and getting it going, any lessons to share that, with, with people watching? Uh, it's a lot simpler than when you look at it, you think it could be. You know, don't be afraid of it. Oh, 
Excellent. Another question, um, let me see, this is up a bit. Um, how, how do you do your monitoring and dashboarding and so on? How do you monitor this, this system? Question for both of you, really. I can go over yeah. the iSpy stuff. Yeah. So I mentioned the, I skipped over it, but I mentioned the iSpy stuff earlier, which is our internal trace system. Um, so let me just bring that slide up. So the way we do this is actually, you saw there were sort of several points in the routes where we had this thing called iSpy wired in. Um, that um, actually generates SNS messages off to the side. Um, so we'll start processing a message and we'll generate an SNS message saying, yep, we received that. And then as we go through sort of the work that what that component is doing at sort of business critical points, we will generate other events. So this is an example of us assembling a, a, a source piece of video for a, um, for a live program. And those SNS events all then get wired into a queue that then goes, actually, we've got a bridge that takes it off to Splunk. So we take those SNS oh, events, put them all into Splunk. And one of the key things we do is each message as it enters our system is given a correlation ID. And then that ID is copied across um, from one message to another as it's processed. Um, do you have any alarms? Each time. Uh, yes, so we will typically do alarming um, or set up alarms on the actual queues themselves. So oh, we'll often use the CloudWatch metrics for the queues themselves. So if we see messages backing up, um, particularly those dead letter queues I mentioned earlier, oh. those should always have a queue depth of zero, basically. Right. Um, so if there's more than one message on the dead letter queue, then or more than zero messages on the dead letter queue, then that, that's a problem. Um, and that will alert our, uh, alert our monitoring team. So I hope you don't uh, get paged at night very often. No, it's yeah. it's pretty it's pretty smooth most of the time. But we have written tools for our monitoring team so that they can actually respool those messages off the dead letter queue and back into the input queue of the the application. So if the if the problem's being caused by you know another system that's down, our, our monitoring team are very likely to be aware of that. Um, and they can actually safely leave the messages on the dead letter queue until the point of that other system's up, and then they can press, press the, the respool button and um, have the messages all be processed again, which is much better than us sitting there hammering a poor system while it's, it's having trouble. Mm. Um, for, for us, one of the additional things that we do, apart from you know, the CloudWatch metrics of you know, queue length, queue age, uh, we... Uh, monitor how often we've seen a file that comes through that is an older file. Uh, we also monitor how long uh, we see a publish go through the system. So we uh, in, inject a test scene into each of our platforms right at the top of our system. Uh, and then we pull down the actual broadcast transmission from the local transmitter, decode that stream, and check to see that we've got that file through. And we have a dashboard that then shows how long it takes for that file to get through. Uh, and so one of the first things I do every morning when I come in is have a look at the graph overnight and see whether we've seen any spikes in there. And if we see a small spike, we can go and investigate. If we see a larger spike, then uh, hopefully an on-call engineer has been called out anyway. Uh, but we can then go back and find out exactly which part of our system has then had a problem, why that problem occurred, uh, and then uh, look to resolve it. Well, that uh, sounds like life at AWS, actually. So, folks, it being 45 minutes past the hour, there's lots more we could talk about, but at this point, I think we'll draw a line in it, under it. Um, now, I, I pointed out we're eight hours separation from these gentlemen, which means it's after 6 p.m. there now in London, so, so thank you for coming in to our office and, and staying late. And uh, that'll be it for this week. Now, I'd like to remind everybody we'll be back next week to talk about our, I think, our newest messaging service, or one of our newest, anyhow, Pinpoint, which is really quite a bit different from all the others. And unlike, uh, it'll be the first one we're going into uh, where I don't actually understand it very well. So I'm going to be learning along with the audience. The title of the thing is Messaging for Real-Time User Engagement. 
So thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Chris. Uh, goodbye, everybody. And uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.